Faraday's galvanometer and modern galvanometers operate on the same principle, the tendency of a magnetic element to align itself in the direction of the surrounding magnetic field. But they function very differently. Modern galvanometers measure electric current, that is, the more or less steady rate of flow of electricity through a conductor. But Faraday's galvanometer served primarily to measure the total quantity of electricity in a short burst of current, something that modern instruments cannot do. Faraday's instrument possessed this distinctive electric ability because by mere good fortune, it seems, it boasted distinctive mechanical features that modern galvanometers do not. We can best appreciate those features by looking first at a device we know well from the first semester junior laboratory, the pendulum. Here is a simple pendulum consisting of a wooden ball suspended on a fine thread. The ball hangs vertically since the only force acting on it is its weight. But we can use the pendulum to measure horizontal forces since such forces will deflect it from the vertical position. For example, suppose I push the pendulum like this. There we go. Nice. <laughs> OK. Suppose I push the pendulum like that. <laughs> from the resulting angle of deflection, we can calculate the force my hand is exerting. In this case, I have displaced the pendulum three and one quarter inches from its equilibrium position. The suspension thread is 21 inches long, so a horizontal deflection of three and one quarter inches means that the applied force F is to the tension in the thread OB as three and one quarter is to 21, so that you see the calculation, the horizontal force is about 16% of the pendulum's weight. So the pendulum can be used to measure a steady force. And it can even measure a changing force if the change is not too rapid. See how the deflection changes. As I very slow, as I slowly vary the strength of my push. For each fleeting value of deflection, we could calculate the corresponding force as before. But watch what happens when I apply a momentary force. So now I'm finally hoping to use a hammer to give a brief tap to the pendulum. There it is. Yes, <laughs> Okay, the hammer's tap occupied but a moment of time. Did the pendulum likewise jump out suddenly and back in a moment of time? Of course not. It takes almost three quarters of a second to swing out and back, since a pendulum of 21 inches length has a period of nearly one and one half seconds. What did the pendulum do, in fact? it sailed out to a maximum deflection of about five inches and would have continued to oscillate had I not caught it. This initial maximum is highly significant for it is proportional to the velocity that the pendulum acquired from the hammer's tap. Juniors prove this in connection with Huygens's colliding pendulums. There are, almost, there are any number of ways to show the proportionality but it follows almost instantly from the paradigm circle. Juniors and seniors know this circle well, but for any of you who do not, the paradigm circle allows us to deduce the motion of a pendulum from the geometry of regular circular motion. This video clip will give you the idea. As the solid dot moves repeatedly around the circle, its horizontal displacement from the center is effectively equal to the displacement of a pendulum from its central position. Although actual pendulums depart slightly from the paradigm, the differences become minute 
when pendulums are restricted to small angles, angles of less than about 10 degrees. With that reminder then, let us show that the pendulum's maximum displacement, its amplitude, is proportional to its velocity at the central position. Let A be a radius of the paradigm circle. If the endpoint moves around the circumference at a constant rate of f revolutions per second, its speed along the circumference will be f times the length of one circumference, that is, f times 2 pi a. Red arrows indicate the velocity at two specific points in the sketch. The endpoint in position 1 corresponds to the pendulum passing through its central position with a speed 2 pi f a, while position 2 corresponds to the pendulum having reached its maximum deflection, equal to the radius a. But a is proportional to 2 pi f a, since both f and 2 pi are constants. Thus, the pendulum's maximum deflection is indeed proportional to its velocity at the central position. And therefore, in our case, if a pendulum resting at its central position is suddenly propelled with some initial velocity, it will swing out to a maximum deflection proportional to that velocity. And therefore, by measuring that maximum, we effectively measure the initial velocity. So we see that a pendulum can be used as a measuring instrument in two modes. First, a steady state mode, which is appropriate for measuring a constant or slowly changing force. Second, a mode suited to measuring the initial velocity of the pendulum. But remember that in order for the velocity so measured to qualify as the initial velocity, it must be fully imparted before the pendulum has stirred significantly from its resting position. And this condition will be met only if the force acts over a time that is very short compared to the period of the pendulum. It must be a momentary force. Since this is definitely the case for Huygens' colliding pendulums, you can see that his pendulums constitute a signal example of that second mode of operation, and I will therefore refer to it as Huygens mode. Mm -hmm. Now, notice that our previous reasoning made no assumptions as to how the initial velocity was acquired. In Huygens's collisions, it is the result of a single blow, but clearly the proportionality would hold equally well if the velocity were imparted through a series of impacts rather than a single one so long as they are all completed within a time much shorter than the time of the swing. The pendulum in Huygens mode is therefore an integrator. When it receives a series of blows within a sufficiently short time, it effectively adds up the individual velocities as though they were all produced by a single impact. The total velocity is therefore, in effect, the initial velocity of the pendulum, which in turn swings out to a peak deflection proportional to that total. You can see then that a pendulum will be best suited for use in Huygens mode when it has a long period, since it will then have plenty of time to receive multiple impacts before it moves very far from its resting position. the pendulum can function as an integrator in still another way. Sometimes the force applied is just too small to produce a measurable deflection, as it is here, where I direct a mere puff of air against the suspended weight. As you see, the weight moves only a fraction of an inch. But if I direct repeated puffs 
at intervals equal to the pendulum's period, the way parents time their pushes of a child's swing, the motion gradually builds up to a considerable amount. In this way, the pendulum can reveal influences that would otherwise be too small to be detected. Now, how does all this apply to the galvanometer? One early form of galvanometer was essentially a magnetic compass, a magnetized needle pivoting in the Earth's magnetic field. It is decidedly analogous to a pendulum, which is a weight suspended in a gravitational field. As we earlier subjected the vertical pendulum to a perpendicular mechanical force, so we may expose this north pointing compass to a perpendicular magnetic force by sending an electric current through a suitably oriented coil. Both the gravitational pendulum and the magnetic compass experience a restoring force, more or less proportional to any small deviation from their natural alignment. Juniors derive this proportionality for the gravitational pendulum in the first semester laboratory. Let us now show that the same proportionality holds for the magnetized needle. Let Q be the north pole of a magnetized needle pivoting at O. And let QN represent the force of the Earth's magnetic field on it. If the needle is displaced from the northerly direction by some angle theta, it will be urged back towards a north-south orientation by the force QT. The tangential component of Qn. And Qt over Qn is sine of theta. If you can see that in the little triangle. Then since the Earth's field is constant, force Qn is constant. So that Qt is proportional to sine theta. But as juniors know very well by now, when theta is small, sine theta is very nearly proportional to theta. Thus, the restoring force QT is very nearly proportional to angle theta, provided the angle is small. Such a restriction to small angles is unavoidable when the restoring force arises trigonometrically, as it does in both the magnetic compass and the gravitational pendulum. But Faraday's instrument escapes that limitation by employing a slender thread to supply a restoring force when twisted. I'll say more about that technique shortly. What is important to us at this point is that since the galvanometer is governed by the same mechanical principles as the pendulum, it too, like the pendulum, will be operable in either of two modes. That is, in fact, the main difference between modern galvanometers and Faraday's instrument. Most modern galvanometers contain a movement like the one shown on the left. They are meant to read the value of an electric current that is either steady or, at most, slowly varying. And in order to attain the correct reading quickly, they are intentionally designed with a short one-way swing time, the hallmark of steady state mode. Three-tenths of a second is typical for a modern instrument. But Faraday's galvanometer, like the instrument shown on the right, had a far longer swing time, nearly seven seconds. His instrument was therefore ideally suited to the Huygens mode, as he explains, without using that term, in the 29th series. It must be well understood that in all the observations made with this instrument, the swing is observed and counted as the effect produced, unless otherwise expressed. A constant current in an instrument 
will give a constant and continued deflection. But such is not the case here. The currents observed are for short periods, and they give, as it were, a blow or push to the needle, the effect of which, in swinging the needle, continues to increase the extent of the deflection long after the current is over. Nevertheless, the extent of the swing is dependent on the electricity which passed in that brief current, and, as the experiments seem to indicate, is simply proportional to it, whether the electricity pass in a longer or a shorter time. And notwithstanding the comparative variability of the current in strength during the time of its continuance, Notice, in particular, the final sentence of this passage, where Faraday cites experiments which show that the galvanometer's initial swing retains its significance, notwithstanding the comparative variability of the current. Faraday thus encountered the same integrating quality in his galvanometer as we found in Huygens' pendulum. And therefore, I think we might well call it the integrating galvanometer. Let us review some of Faraday's experiments. We will then understand why the integrative property of his galvanometer turned out to be so important to Faraday's thinking. To begin with, Faraday determined that the initial swing of the integrating galvanometer is a measure of the quantity of electricity passed through it. He describes a lovely sequence of experiments to this end in the third series, and a more extensive set in the eleventh series. We can carry out similar trials for ourselves with a galvanometer suited, like Faraday's, to operation in Huygens mode. Such an instrument is this one which is on the table, but you might get a better view from the photographs. It's made from simple materials, and it is by no means as sensitive as Faraday's, but for our purpose, it doesn't need to be. The photograph on the left shows the completed instrument. On the right, we see it with coils and angular scale removed. If you are interested in its construction, I have a bunch of handouts here on the table, and you are welcome to take a copy after the talk. But I must call your attention to two ways in which this instrument, like Faraday's, differs from the simple compass-based instrument we saw earlier. Notice first that the device employs not just one pivoting magnet, but two one mounted directly above the other on a single armature. They are oppositely directed, so that together they cancel one another out and so render the instrument nearly indifferent to the Earth's magnetic influence. This, of course, means that the Earth's magnetic field no longer provides the restoring force. Instead, that force is supplied by the suspension thread as it twists. The current carrying coil is so mounted as to influence primarily only the lower of the two magnets, so this design effectively balances the current's magnetic influence against the thread's rotational elasticity. Since the thread is very delicate, it exerts a turning force much smaller than that arising from the Earth's field. This makes for a far more sensitive instrument. Moreover, the turning force of a slender thread is not just approximately, but strictly proportional to the angle of twist, so the instrument can attain large angles without suffering any loss of proportionality. Let me illustrate this with an experiment. This is a reproduction of the inductive apparatus Faraday used in the 11th series. When he charged it with a quantity of electricity and then connected it to an identical uncharged device, 
the charge was shared equally. Each apparatus ended up with half the original quantity of electricity. This modern capacitor can be regarded as a highly miniaturized version of Faraday's apparatus. It incorporates conductive surfaces spaced microscopically close together and electrically is the equivalent of 100 million of Faraday's devices. I will charge it with a quantity of electricity, then discharge that electricity through the galvanometer. Before we begin, though, notice that the galvanometer's pointer is slightly warped. And it reads an initial position of three degrees rather than zero. We will correct for this. Now I charge the capacitor by momentarily connecting it to a battery. And when I discharge it through the galvanometer, the pointer swings to a maximum deflection of 50 degrees for a net deflection of 47 degrees. Next, I charge the capacitor again, but then immediately connect it to an identical capacitor so that each capacitor now sustains half the previous quantity of electricity. When I discharge it this time, the deflection is 27 degrees for a net deflection of 24 degrees, very nearly half the previous deflection. Half the charge resulted in half the deflection. So we have illustrated the principal feature of Faraday's galvanometer, that its deflection is proportional to the quantity of electricity that passes through it, even when the angle of deflection is large. Now, juniors and seniors will recall that in the first series, Faraday had studied the current which developed when a length of wire was moved about a stationary magnet. In this drawing, Faraday summarizes a number of experiments in which a wire positioned either as NP or N prime P prime moves parallel to itself about one pole of a magnet along either of the paths shown. The ends of the wire are connected to the integrating galvanometer. As Faraday reports, a current arises whenever the wire moves, I quote, so as to cut the magnetic curves. What are these magnetic curves? He explains in a footnote that they are, quoting again, the lines of magnetic forces which would be depicted by iron filings. We are all familiar with such patterns, especially those obtained for a bar magnet, the pattern that Faraday will, 20 years later, call spondyloid and illustrate in the drawing on the right. But notice that in the figure from the first series on the left, Faraday makes no effort to represent the magnetic curves visually. He appears to treat them as possessing even less physical reality than do the paths of the moving wire, which are at least represented by dotted lines. What then can Faraday mean by his verb cut? when he speaks of the wire cutting magnetic curves as it moves. It is certainly not the sort of cutting that is involved in, say, cutting a rope. There is no suggestion of anything being cleaved, sundered, or split apart. Faraday's cutting has there only a geometrical sense, the sense we know from Euclid. When one Euclidean line cuts another, it passes across it, as in Book 1, Proposition 15. For let the straight lines A, B, C, D cut one another at the point E. Similarly, in Faraday's diagram, the path of the moving wire, the dotted line, passes across the magnetic curves, or would do so if the curves were depicted. In the first series, Faraday does not yet regard the magnetic curves 
as physical entities. Iron filings are physical objects. The curves in which they arrange themselves are not. In the second series, Faraday does undertake to depict visually the circular magnetic curves that surround a current carrying wire, as in this detail from his figure 40. And when in his subsequent discussion he describes a second parallel wire approaching the first, he says once again that the moving wire will cut those curves. But for the rest of that discussion, he never again uses the term cut, but substitutes the less material verb intersect instead. And if you doubt that intersect is a less material verb, consider that we never ask if we can intersect ourselves a slice of cake. <laughs> Faraday is per perfectly explicit about the immaterial character of the magnetic curves when he describes them as mere expressions for arranged magnetic forces. Nevertheless, there are signs that this interpretation may be too restrained. For in the very same paragraph, Faraday notices that the magnetic curves about a varying electric current appear to be capable of expanding and contracting, actions that would seem to represent a surprising degree of structural integrity for a supposedly immaterial object. Here is an experiment similar to the one Faraday saw as disclosing such expansion and contraction. Some of you may have carried out such an experiment in the junior lab. <coughs> Here, coil A on the left is being energized with an electric current. So we know that it is surrounded by magnetic curves having the sphondyloid pattern shown in the sketch. Coil B on the right is connected to our integrating galvanometer. If I move the energized coil, its magnetic curves will move too, and their motion should induce a current in coil B. And as you see, the galvanometer's initial deflection is to the right when the coil approaches and to the left when the coil retreats. Evidently, an initial galvanometer thrust to the right signifies that magnetic curves are advancing towards coil B, while a thrust to the left means that the curves are receding from it. Now let the coil A remain stationary and not energized. When I send a current through it, the galvanometer again deflects to the right. Evidently, magnetic curves are once again approaching coil B, and if so, they must be expanding outward from their source. On the other hand, when I stop the current, the initial thrust is to the left. We may then infer with Faraday that when the current in a conductor increases, its associated magnetic curves swell outward from the conductor. And when the current decreases, those same magnetic curves contract inward again. As I stated earlier, such expansion and contraction would seem to imply structural integrity and therefore physicality in the magnetic curves. But as signs of physicality, Expansion and contraction cannot be considered strong evidence, nor would they have carried much weight with Faraday, for only a few months before completing the second series, he had experienced an optical illusion while viewing two spoked wheels, one mounted behind the other and slightly offset like this. The alternating dark and light curves you see here are formed by the periodic regions of narrow and wide spacing between the overlapping radii. 
It is called a moiré pattern. The name comes from a species of silk textile made by pressing two layers of fabric together. Faraday was greatly taken with the strong resemblance between these mirage-like moiré curves and the magnetic curves that iron filings describe in the vicinity of a stubby magnet. Let's look at both of them together and so make that resemblance easier to see. Can you see the similarity? <laughs> Evidently, curves strongly resembling those displayed by iron filings need not possess any physical structure at all. But what about the apparent ability of magnetic curves to expand and contract, as Faraday reported in the second series? Well, one of the most striking features of moiré patterns is that a very slight displacement of either of the underlying lattices results in considerable motion of the overall pattern. In this slide, identical spoked wheels overlap by slightly different amounts. The resulting moiré patterns are nearly identical but you'll notice that one pattern is slightly larger than the other. So if we shift one of the spoked wheels back and forth with respect to the other, the generated pattern will appear to expand and contract. I've made a short video to illustrate this. You see that the phenomena of expansion and contraction can be produced by illusion alone and therefore they are not, after all, reliable indicators of physicality. A different intimation of physicality may seem to present itself when Faraday sweeps a straight wire of fixed length back and forth through the Earth's magnetic field. As his figure shows, the moving wire is part of the galvanometer circuit the galvanometer deflects to the left when the wire is swung from west to east, to the right when the wire is moved from east to west. This experiment beautifully illustrates the galvanometer's integrative ability, since when the wire is moved quickly to any position and immediately back again, it reads zero. That is, the sum of two equal but opposite electrical impulses. But it bears more significantly on the question of physicality because the terrestrial magnetic field is uniform and therefore motion through it does not change the magnetic conditions to which the wire is exposed. If the conditions are constant, why should there be any effect at all? Can motion itself be a cause? Newton inferred the reality of absolute space from the mechanical effect of rotary motion. May we similarly attribute physical reality to the magnetic field as being the underlying ground by whose means motion produces an electrical effect? But a question that students regularly and justifiably ask of Newton is equally pertinent in this case too. How does the wire know it is moving? Does the magnetic field incorporate some system of landmarks by which the motion is defined? But in a region of uniform magnetic conditions, what such framework of markers could there possibly be? we might anticipate one answer. The array of magnetic curves themselves could constitute the necessary framework if only they could be shown to have individual and therefore physical existence. But as we just saw, neither the recognizability of their shapes nor the structural hardiness they seem to exhibit is enough to establish the magnetic curves as having physical status. By the 28th series, however, the magnetic curves have unmistakably emerged for Faraday. 
as physical objects in their own right. He calls them by a new name, lines of force. This is a term he had adopted in the 11th series in connection with electric induction, and one which had already begun to take on a physical connection because of the ability of induction to act in curved paths. Yet, from Faraday's remarks at the conclusion of the 28th series, it is clear that for some 19 years he had remained doubtful as to the status of these lines. Moreover, he realizes that his own terminology had perpetuated that doubt. Whilst writing this paper, I perceive that in the late series of these researches, I have sometimes used the term lines of force so vaguely as to leave the reader doubtful whether I intended it as a merely representative idea of the forces or as the description of the path along which the power was continuously exerted. Let it be understood that wherever the expression line of force is taken simply to represent the disposition of the forces, it shall have the fullness of that meaning. But that wherever it may seem to represent the idea of the physical mode of transmission of the force, it expresses in that respect the opinion to which I incline at present. What does Faraday discover in the 28th series that finally sways him to incline, as he says, towards the view that the lines of force are truly physical entities? I think he discovers two things. First, that the lines of force can be counted. Second, that they are no mere landmarks in magnetic space, but are the very bearers of the magnetic force. The integrating galvanometer plays an essential part in both of these discoveries. Let us see how that comes about. One of the earliest experiments in the 28th series is this one, in which Faraday moves a loop of wire from position A, a short distance from the magnet, to position B, where it encircles the magnet. In order to appreciate more fully the reason for moving the loop in just that way, let me superimpose this figure upon Faraday's illustration of the magnet's lines of force as revealed by iron filings. It is perhaps not too much to imagine that as Faraday positioned the wire loop, he could picture this pattern of lines of force in his mind's eye. Now it is clear that when the loop is shifted repeatedly from position A to position B, it will cut the same lines of force each time. Faraday contrives to connect the wire loop to the galvanometer while moving the loop from A to B, but to disconnect it while he brings it back from B to A. He is able to do this several times during the galvanometer's slow departure from its initial position. And in each instance, the galvanometer reading is proportional to the number of placements, and therefore, to the total number of lines of force cut by the loop. Here is Faraday's report. When the bend of wires was formed into a loop and that carried once over the pole, the galvanometer needle was deflected two degrees or more. The vibration of the needle was slow and it was easy, therefore, to reiterate this action five or six times or oftener, breaking and making contact with the galvanometer at right intervals so as to combine the effect of like-induced currents. And then a deflection of 10 degrees or 15 degrees on either side of zero could be readily obtained. What a thrilling account this is! <laughs> 
For if one placement of the loop produced a deflection a little more than two degrees, then the galvanometer deflection is, uh, and, and, and while six more for a total of seven produced 15 degrees, then the galvanometer deflection is just about proportional to the total number of lines of force that have been cut. The integrating galvanometer then, in conjunction with the moving wire, is an instrument capable of counting lines of force. We eagerly read on, waiting in delicious suspense for Faraday to draw this conclusion. But no such momentous announcement is forthcoming. Instead, Faraday writes this thundering anticlimax. The arrangement, therefore, was sufficiently sensible for first experiments. Faraday was not here trying to establish the galvanometer as a counting device. He was merely making sure that it was sufficiently sensitive, sensible in his wording, to register the currents involved. But how could he so completely neglect this demonstration of its capacity to count lines of force, which is surely a far more significant result? In fact, the experiment demonstrated no such result. It merely showed that doing the same thing again and again produced the same outcome again and again. Repeated impulses of current, which we knew already that the galvanometer would sum up. When Faraday does finally link the galvanometer's deflection to the number of lines of force cut, he does so only after an extensive succession of trials, not with the simple wire loop, but with the ingenious rotary apparatus pictured here. What was this device able to establish that the simple wire loop could not? We find a useful clue in Faraday's narrative when he does, at last, draw the expected conclusion. The amount of magnetic force, as shown by its effect in evolving electric currents, is determinant for the same lines of force, whatever their form or their distance from the seat of the power may be. I have highlighted Faraday's phrase, their distance from the seat of the power. Remember that when, what the galvanometer really indicates is quantity of electric charge. So merely showing that the same lines of force produce the same quantity of charge when cut again and again at the same place was not enough to conclude he was counting lines. For we have all observed that a magnet exercises weaker influence at longer distances than at shorter ones. It is possible, then, that each line of force represents less force the further it extends from the magnet itself. If so, then when cut at greater distance, it would produce less charge in the moving wire. If we are to rule out this possibility, we shall have to find a way to cut the same lines of force at different locations and see whether the currents produced are still the same. If they are, then, and only then, can we say that the magnetic power associated with each line belongs to it everywhere, and therefore truly belongs to the line itself, not simply to the places through which it passes. Faraday's rotary apparatus could test lines of force at various distances from the magnet, for the wire labeled L in his diagram may have any shape and extend to any length. Faraday does not make this point very emphatically in the 28th series, but it receives explicit attention in his laboratory diary. Here is a portion of his diary entry for 16 July, 1851. The next point was as to the effect of distance of the still part of the wire under the moving magnet. 
or of the moving wire from the still magnet. The still wire being near the magnet, about one inch off only, then 10 revolutions of the magnet with a moderate velocity gave a deflection of nine degrees. Then the wire being farther off and about three inches distant, 10 revolutions gave nine degrees of deflection as before. Hence, the distance of the wire from the revolving magnet makes no difference in the result. The same amount of electricity being evolved by the same angular journey in the one case as in the other. And we know that if the magnet were still and the wire moving, the effects are the same as if the wire were still and the magnet moving in the reverse direction. Faraday has routed the wire from A, a point nearly on the magnet's axis, to B, a point on the equator. Thus, no matter what path the wire takes from A to B, it will cross the same lines of force. To see this, let us superimpose Faraday's diary sketch upon the same spondyloid pattern of iron filings as before. You can see that whether the wire follows the black path or the red path from A to B, it must cut the same lines of force, but it will cut them at different places. The great advantage of Faraday's integrating galvanometer is here evident. For although the quantity of electricity produced by the rotary apparatus was clearly very small, the galvanometer's slow swing time enabled it to respond to the total quantity of electricity evolved by 10 turns of the device, and so attain a peak deflection of nine degrees. In contrast, a modern galvanometer, with its characteristically rapid swing, would have barely enough time to respond to each turn singly for an unconvincing steady deflection of less than one degree. Then, since Faraday obtained the same peak deflection for the same number of turns, no matter whether the path AB was long or short, he knows that the electricity evolved by, the, by lines of force when cut near the pole is exactly equal to the electricity evolved by the same lines when cut further from the pole. This is what allows him to conclude that each line represents a determinate amount of magnetic power in itself. Every line is therefore a locus of constant power. And the reason why, magnet, the, why magnets exercise lesser influence at more distant locations is not because the force of each line diminishes with distance but simply because the lines spread out and are therefore fewer in number per unit area at those locations. Faraday's magnificent paper of 1852 on the physical character of the lines of magnetic force takes for its basis this very point of view that magnets do not themselves possess the distinctive magnetic power but are, as he says, mere habitations of lines of force. And that it is the lines which are the bearers of the magnetic power. They constitute, as Faraday says, an atmosphere of power. Although this atmosphere may take many forms, all of them, he argues, are variations of the fundamental svandaloid. Faraday's argument is largely visual consisting of a highly persuasive comparative display of several of the forms he has produced and studied. The eye alone suggests the fundamental unity which those forms share, forms such as the ones pictured here. More importantly, though, to Faraday, these configurations share not only a common shape, but a common allotment of total power which persists, at least ideally, throughout every degree of contortion or topological transformation. 
But how can Faraday say anything at all about the power represented by a pattern of magnetic lines? Where power is concerned, visual cues are not enough. The magnetic curves formed by iron filings suggest, but they cannot prove, that the strength of magnetic force depends on the concentration of lines of force. It must be well understood that these forms give no indication by their appearance of the relative strength of the magnetic force at different places, inasmuch as the appearance of the lines depends greatly upon the quantity of filings. But the direction and forms of the lines are well given, and these indicate in a considerable degree the direction in which the forces increase and diminish. The patterns of magnetic curves appear highly readable to the eye. But to secure that readability, Faraday needs principles of interpretation. Where do these principles come from? They come from the moving wire and integrative galvanometer. Faraday acknowledges this when he says, all the phenomena of the moving wire seem to me to show the physical existence of an atmosphere of power about a magnet. And when there are several magnets in presence and in restrained conditions, the lines of force which they present by filings are most varied and beautiful, but all are easily read and understood by the principles I have set forth. Chief among these principles is that each line of force comprises the same quantity of power. And we saw how central was the integrating galvanometer to the establishment of that precept. Faraday's marvelous declaration, which I have highlighted in the slide, also reminds us that the essential motive in experimental philosophy is interpretation. Its highest precepts are not laws, like Newton's laws of motion, but interpretive principles. The application of laws to phenomena discloses regularity. The pursuit of interpretation yields intelligibility. I continually find inviting affinities between Faraday's investigative inquiries and the path of philosophical enlightenment Plato describes in his Allegory of the Cave in Book 7 of the Republic. Under Faraday's experimental art, natural phenomena reveal themselves in successively more and more intelligible forms much as Plato's cave dwellers exchange the sight of shadows for direct experience of the objects which cast them. But have you noticed that Plato's allegory is almost exclusively concerned with sight? His cave dwellers seem to have only two faculties, sight and speech. Apparently lacking any motility of their own, their gaze has to be forcibly turned away from the shadows and towards the fire. If, after that, they make any progress towards the mouth of the cave, it is because they are dragged up a steep and rugged ascent, that's the Jawa translation, mm -hmm. by some external agent. Their life is a drama of the eye, culminating in the sight of the sun itself. But Faraday is an experimental philosopher and cultivates the hand as well as the eye. His cave is the basement laboratory of the Royal Institution, pictured here in one of Harriet Moore's wonderful watercolors, and which we may note includes a fire, as well as a narrow passage leading to a view of the sunlit exterior. 
That is not to suggest that the phenomena Faraday views there are mere shadows. They are not. But neither do they convey their full meaning at first view. They invite and demand a level of interpretation that the eye alone cannot supply. Instruments like the moving wire moved by the hand and the galvanometer built by the hand are necessary too. Yet if the eye is not self-sufficient, neither is the hand. You will recall Faraday's first moving wire experiment. There, the hand placed the wire loop, but it had to rely on the eye's apprehension of the pattern of iron phalanx in order to place the loop accurately. The platonic spirit elevates the eye above all faculties. In a quite contrary spirit, Macbeth's eye, I have thee not, and yet I see thee still, is refuted by his hand. But in Faraday's experimental researches, there is no quarrel between eye and hand. The eye is the conductor of the hands. The hand is the mentor of the eye. Thank you all.